Hello, Devlin Bishop here with you, and welcome to another edition of the Mondo Nostalgia Podcast. And I have an interesting one today, because I don't know if this is going to get a lot of hits, and that's the reason why I'm doing it, because this should get a lot of hits. Because today I am going to worship Paul Williams a little. Now, for you uh, soap opera fans, you're probably thinking, boy, he really likes that uh, Doug Davidson character from The Young and the Restless. And that just saddens me, although I have nothing against The Young and the Restless or that character. But Paul Williams should be more of a household name than he is. Now, people from my generation probably know him because he is a very famous singer, songwriter, actor, and uh, in the 70s and 80s, he was pretty much everywhere. And he still shows up from time to time, which is absolutely cool. Now, I first became a fan of Paul Williams when I was young and I stayed up for the Late Late movie to watch Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, he played the character Swan, which is the villain in the character uh, in the movie. And uh, he was just mind-blowing. I love that movie so much, and uh, I also learned that he wrote the music for it, and that just blew me away. So, being a big fan of him. But as I said, when you grew up in the 70s, you also saw him on TV a lot. He would show up on TV shows like Beretta and Police Woman and The Love Boat and and uh, The Odd Couple and Hardy Boys and just everything. You'd turn on the TV and he'd be on like the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. He'd be on like Merv Griffin. He'd be on Circus of the Stars. And you just assumed, you know, he was a celebrity. But except for Phantom of the Paradise. Oh, and I'd even go to other movies like, you know, Battle, Bene uh, Battle of the Planet of the Apes. And, uh, you know, the Smokey and the Bandit series. And he would just be there. And it was kind of great. As I said, he's um, just, he was a big celebrity. But back in the 70s and 80s, you could be a celebrity. You know, there were so many game shows. You know, he'd be on Match Game and just so many other things. It was just kind of mind-blowing. But, you know, I always admired him. But it wasn't until, you know, years later that I got to know even more about him where I really became a huge Paul Williams fan. It was probably maybe about, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I always knew Paul Williams was a songwriter, but I didn't realize just to the extent that he was. And after my one of my multiple viewings of Phantom of the Paradise, I decided to do some research and realized that Paul Williams actually wrote a lot of my favorite songs. Not only that, is he has won Grammys, he's won Golden Globes, he's won an Oscar. He's just everywhere. So on top of him being a celebrity, also being in one of my favorite movies of all time, he's this amazing songwriter. For the Carpenters, he wrote We Only Just Begun and Rainy Days and Mondays. Helen Reddy, he wrote You and Me Against the World. Three Dog Night, he wrote Just an Old Fashioned Love Song. Barbara Streisand had this melody and uh, she called Paul Williams and said, could you put lyrics to it? And that song became Evergreen. Paul Williams also wrote more songs for her Star is Born movie with Chris Christopherson. But Evergreen got him an Oscar. It got him, you know, like a uh, record of the year at the Grammys and stuff. So he was really popular. But I was really becoming more intrigued by him with more I was learning about him. I thought to myself... He never had a top 40 hit that he sang, but he wrote all these other ones for other people. He also wrote, how could I forget, The Rainbow Connection for Kermit the Frog in the Muppet movie. <laughs> Along with that, he did other soundtracks besides Phantom of the Paradise, which he also got an Oscar nomination for, for original score. 
He did movies like Bugsy Malone and the Muppet movie and just Star is Born, lots of different things. What even intrigued me even more was apparently he actually wrote the lyrics for the Love Boat theme. They had an instrumental track, but when they went to become original, like it was a TV movie, but when they went to become a weekly series, they wanted lyrics. And he gave us those amazing lyrics. Love Boat theme is one of my favorites. You're all going to go look that up probably after this show. So I was falling more and more for Paul Williams. And then I stumbled on something that... Uh, he kind of left the limelight for a while because he had some addictions, alcohol and drugs, and he kind of fell off the map for a bit. He'd still show up in things, but uh, just not as much. But what also interested me was the fact that he never had a top 40 hit that was his own, as in he sang it. He had albums and stuff, and they did okay, but... Why was a songwriter such a big celebrity at the time? Like, sure, he was doing acting and stuff, but the truth of the matter is, is songwriters, unless you did your own singing, wouldn't show up on TV shows and stuff that regularly. And it turns out that uh, Paul Williams' dream was to be an actor. But a lot of people told him. For those of you who don't know Paul Williams, he's only he stands five foot two. Uh, he has has uh, like a, a a disease or something that like limits his height. He had long blonde hair. He was a little on the chubby side, and he usually wore dark glasses or tinted glasses, not really dark ones. He wasn't what you say the prettiest. Um, person in Hollywood, but he was powerful at the time. When he was offered the job of Phantom of the Paradise, he was actually offered the part of um, the Phantom, uh, the Winslow character. And when he read the script, he came back to them and said that not only did he think he was more like Swan, who was this rich billionaire who abused women and drugs and all this other stuff and had such a big ego, and he honestly told Brian De Palma he would fit this character because he understands this character. Because even though he wasn't like the prettiest guy at the table, he knew what power was. And, well, in hindsight, he was right because it eventually led to alcohol, drugs, bad relationships, uh, broken marriages, and... Uh, he totally related with Swan, and not only did he want to play Swan, he wanted to take a crack at the songs and the soundtrack. And Phantom of the Paradise is one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. So anyhow, they gave him Swan. And uh, yeah, and I, it just interested me. But I was saddened to hear that he kind of lost his way, and you know, suddenly phones weren't calling and stuff. Then I came across a, uh, a thing where there was a documentary called Paul Williams, Still Alive. It was a Steve Kessler movie, and he decided that he was just as obsessed with Paul Williams as I was, and he decided to follow him around in his new life, uh, which is very more stripped down than what he is living now. If you get a chance, I strongly recommend it, especially if you are a fan. If not, there might be some spoilers here, but if you read anything about Paul Williams, you'd know about it. <clears throat> it's not the greatest documentary, but what I love about it is it actually comes through in the end. And so if you want to go watch the documentary, I strongly recommend it, then come back and listen to this. If not, there may be some spoilers, which is weird to say with a documentary. The reason it's hard to watch is because uh, this Steve Kessler really idolized Paul Williams. And it starts great because Paul Williams wasn't certain he wanted a documentary about him. But he let this Steve Kessler guy film performances and stuff. And he'd play smaller venues. But... The enthusiasm of the people that showed up to see him is so wonderful to see. 
Because I remember when I started finding out more and more about Paul Williams, I would tell people, you know, Paul Williams is a god to me. He's right up there with all these other great celebrities and stuff. And it was nice to see that I wasn't alone. There was a lot of people that were like, just remembered how incredible he was and still is. I mentioned he's not the prettiest looking guy, though I find him attractive because I'm attracted to personalities. Well, sure, everybody likes looks, but when you have a good personality, that wins me over, and talent does too. Paul Williams also doesn't have the greatest voice, but there's something about the songs he writes. He wrote a lot about loneliness. He wrote a lot about just not fitting in or or just doing everything you can to survive. And I actually find he's recorded a lot of versions of his own songs. And I actually, although I love the originals, I love hearing Paul Williams versions because you can hear that he really writes in a different style. It's old fashioned, but he gets a lot of the emotions and when you hear them coming from his own voice I, I strongly recommend you checking out some of his versions of like rainy days and Mondays or you know we've only just begun and stuff uh, he's he's just got some amazing music uh, I don't know if he's like on streaming services like Spotify but if you're a fan I definitely think you should check it out and definitely the songs from Phantom of the Paradise and you know, the Rainbow Connection, like, that song is, well, that and uh, a Phantom's theme are, are, are in my top songs of all time. But anyhow, uh, yeah, so he'd perform these songs and then fans would come up and he's very humbled and he has a very simple life now. But the reason the documentary is only slightly, like, it's good and not great is because Paul Williams is a hard nut to crack and even Steve Kessler gets to the point where he's almost like I don't know if he's ever going to give me anything and there's moments where he's kind of like my dad I think that's why I probably also have a because my dad wouldn't talk a lot about his life but when you got something from him it was nice you were just like yes this is what i've been waiting for but sometimes you have to wait a long time and i remember watching it with my partner mike and mike kept saying boy this is the most hardest thing to watch because there's so many scenes where they're just sitting there and nothing's being said or it's just small talk like you know so we got this concert coming up or you know maybe i should get some squid for lunch and, and just stuff like that and whenever the documentarian tries to talk to him it's usually brushed off or something and that and there's he tries to get really probing and deep and Paul Williams never wants to go there. Like, he always brings up, like, you know, well, what happens? You're one of the biggest celebrities. And apparently this happened because he was asked to come on John, John, Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show. <coughs> Excuse me. Which, at the time, biggest show on TV, late night. And he sang a song, and then Johnny asked him over, and Johnny just found Paul Williams very honest and funny. And apparently, after that, He'd be a regular guest on The Tonight Show, and he started getting, like, calls from TV series and stuff because people said, this guy's charismatic. And his, you know, light even went even further. But when his drug addiction got crazy, he started just not doing anything anymore, and people stopped wanting him on the show, and, you know, things change, and suddenly you know, the celebrity system isn't the way. It's all about pretty people or all about, you know, in new generations and stuff. And uh, his, you know, music was very timely and stuff. And even though he, he wrote music all through those times too, it wasn't as remembered or if people liked it, people wouldn't say, oh, that's Paul Williams. <clears throat> so, um, 
every time the documentary tried to take that, Paul Williams didn't really want to talk about that. And it was really frustrating to watch because I kind of wanted to know too. Because he wanted to see, you know, Paul Williams break down or, you know, freak out. Like I was one of the biggest celebrities of all time and now people barely remember me. The whole thing about, you know, Still Alive, the documentary, was the fact that many people probably think Paul Williams is dead. <coughs> Career-wise, a lot of people think he is too. The great thing, though, about the documentary, and made me love Paul Williams even more, is at the very end of the documentary, it's Paul Williams who actually kind of saves the day and not by going in depth, but trying to show Steve Kessler why he's obsessing about the wrong things. <clears throat> and this is pretty brilliant because the director of the documentary was just obsessed with how big he was in the 70s and 80s and how on top of the world he was. And then he went through sobriety and not only just getting clean, but he started helping other people to get clean in his spare time while still, you know, trying to make money and stuff like that. And I guess, you know, as people, we always want <coughs> the dark side of the story. You know, we want to know the anguish he had. We want to know the depression he had when he suddenly realized that Nobody wanted him on TV shows anymore, or he was getting less and less songwriting uh, jobs. And we wanted to see, you know, his total devastation because we needed to see that to see how successful he was. And Paul Williams kind of, without using too many words, basically told him that he figured that the documentarian wanted him to say, yeah, I miss being on top of the world. I had everything. I had women. I had money. I had, you know, any drug I wanted. I could do any show I wanted. And then suddenly I didn't have that anymore. But the truth of the matter is Paul Williams didn't miss that life. In fact, when he watched some of the sequences, he couldn't watch when he was guesting on a, a, a TV show because he knew how high he was. He knew that he wasn't a good husband or father at that time. And it was always constant reminders that people looked at him as, look at the success you have. Don't you wish you had that again? But he didn't see the success. He saw the failures that people didn't know about. The fact that he should have treated his ex-wife's better his kids. So now he lives this smaller life and he's happier than ever. And the thing that makes me so even more in love with this man is that he, he has so much more now, even though he doesn't have like if somebody saw it, like, you know, when you see like people who watch these MTV cribs and you see these people with luxurious mansions and they have like three or four cars in the driveway. He lives this modest life now. He's still making money. He still does gigs. He does. He's 80 years old as of this year. And, you know, he still, you know, shows up in movies. You know, I talk about him in one of my favorite movies of all time, Phantom of the Paradise. But a couple of years ago, he showed up in another one of my favorite movies, Baby Driver, um, where he does a great little part as the butcher. And he's still writing music. He wrote some songs for Still Alive. And he's does some voice work on cartoons and stuff. So he's still keeping busy. He might be slowing down a little bit now because the documentary was, you know, about a decade ago. But the moral of the story is he realized that when he had everything, that wasn't everything about his life at that point. He thought he loved that life, but looking back at it, he didn't. He saw 
all the stuff that he did wrong. And so it was hard for him to relive that and say, oh, yeah, it would be great to be doing that again, because he didn't feel that way. He felt all the people he let down. Now he has a very smaller life, but in his heart, he's got so much more. So every time I think I've learned everything I need to about Paul Williams, I learn even more. And the fact that he has learned that is just incredible because a lot of people don't. And I just wanted to talk about him for a while because he still should be talked about even more so because of getting clean and helping other people and still staying in the limelight and still remembering those accomplishments. I love when a Paul Williams song comes on the radio, whether it's his singing, you know, because I play his stuff in my rotations, or just if you hear The Carpenters or Three Dog Night or, you know, other people he's written for. It's amazing the people he's written for. David Bowie, The Monkees. It's just crazy. And if you love music and you want to hear a songwriter that really loves emotion, you need to go check out some of his stuff, whether he wrote it for others or that. You might not like all of it, but you know what? I'd be shocked if you couldn't find a song you identify with. One thing I learned is the group Daft Punk, who I'm a real fan of, they actually are huge Phantom of the Paradise fans. And not only do they wear masks kind of in honor of that, but they also, on a recent album, when I say recent, probably several years ago, actually had Paul Williams come on to write some lyrics. And basically, they say it's kind of a continuation of what Swan would have written. And it's a beautiful song called Touch. And it's so powerful. And... Even the song Still Alive, he wrote for the documentary, he still writes with that same emotional intensity that he had young. So even though he related to the lifestyle of Swan being over the top, being, you know, just living at the edge, doing whatever he wanted to do, and being allowed to because he had that power, you could tell there was still this emotional side to him where he got love, he got emotions, he got loneliness. And that's the power of Paul Williams in my eyes. As I said, the biggest crime about this podcast is it's not going to get as many hits as me ranking the DC movies. It's not going to get as many hits of me, you know, talking about Marvel movies or Star Wars. And that's a real crime. But you know what? I say this about everything. If I get one person interested in Paul Williams or get them to go to Spotify to listen to some of the songs he's wrote for others or the ones he's performed for himself or just to go to YouTube to see some of his old clips, then I've done something. And I want this show to be about popular things, but I also want this show to be about things that should still be popular. And good songwriting is something that should always be popular. Ah, I could go on and on talking about Paul Williams, whether it's Phantom of the Paradise or Smokey and the Bandit or, you know, his work with the Muppets, like doing the Muppet movie album and uh, Christmas Carol, you know. There's so much things that, and every time I find out more and more about him, there's an old movie called Bugsy Malone that uh, is, uh, it was a weird attempt, uh, an Alan Parker film, where all the young people play gangsters. And it's never explained, it's just, yeah, we're going to just make a gangster film with young people. It stars Scott Bayo and Jodie Foster came out in 1960, uh, 1976, and I recently found out that Paul Williams wrote the music. 
Uh, he also took it to Broadway. Um, uh, it hit Broadway, I can't remember when, but uh, 1997, Bugsy Malone. He also did uh, uh, Happy Days, the musical. It wasn't a very successful one. And he did theater, Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas, which I love that special. Uh, I, Terry, uh, Corda's mother, introduced me to that special. And I she'd always tell me, you should watch it, you should watch it. And I go, I, I don't, it sounds lame. And first time I watched it, I was in tears. It was so sweet and beautiful and still great. And uh, yeah, just so many great things uh, about Paul Williams that, ah, I can't get enough of this man. And uh, I hope Kurt has found some really good pictures of him. And uh, yeah, I hope I've done a little bit to introduce you to Paul Williams. Or if you're someone of my age, re- introduce you to him because I know you've probably watched old TV shows and stuff that he was on or or realized I didn't realize he did the Muppet movie Christmas Carol you know um, but he did and his name shows up so many times and yet he's not talked about in the same vein as some other you know great musicians and uh, well I got my chance to change it up a bit I don't know if I'll ever get to meet Paul Williams or tell him how much I care about him, but I think he loves the people he has met. And it would be awesome if he was just one day flicking around and found this podcast, but then there's another side of me that thinks that he might just not be <laughs> that interested. As in, he'd be happy that somebody's still talking about him, but he would want to look back at all the acclaim that I've given him. But I hope he sees that if he does stumble on this, I can't believe I'm talking like Paul Williams is going to click on this. But I hope he sees the admiration I have for him. And I may love his movies, I may love his songs or his TV appearances. But the fact that he realized he had to do something to save his life and in return has helped so many people, whether it was musically or inspiring them to overcome their demons. That is the thing I love about this man more. So if I talk to him like he's a god, in my eyes he is. And that's why I decided to worship Paul Williams for a bit on this week's podcast. Thank you if you joined me for this love fest. And uh, yeah... Not only will I continue talking about the most popular things, but I will talk about things that I think need to be in the spotlight. And Paul Williams definitely deserves to be. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.